Hello, I'm Bill Poirier, and I'm going to talk about the physics of the observer as it pertains to quantum physics. Now, in quantum physics, the observer plays a very special role, uh, very different from other areas of physics, and we'll talk about why that is. Uh, in, the, in the second talk given by Ken Wharton, you'll hear a bit about the observer in classical physics, uh, but I'm just going to focus on, on quantum physics. And I should mention at the outset that this is very difficult territory from a conceptual and philo philosophical standpoint. And even today, nearly 100 years after the birth of the quantum theory, we still don't have all the answers. So there's still a fair amount of controversy. Before we get into all that, I want to lay down a few quantum ground rules. So, so quantum physics is very strange territory. And um, there are some things that it's useful to keep uh, in mind uh, in what follows. So I'll, I'll mention a few of these as we go. Also, I should mention that you'll find these a more extended discussion in this upcoming title by Multiversal Journeys and Springer. So uh, one of the first things we learn about quantum physics, if you know anything at all about quantum physics, is that small objects are supposed to be both waves and particles, this so-called wave-particle duality. Now, sometimes this gets overstated as follows, tiny objects are both waves and particles at the same time. My own view is that that's a bit of an overstatement. These things are very different from each other. They're, they're, not, uh, they're not consistent. A, a particle has a very localized position in space, like this point here in the line at the bottom of the screen in 1D. A wave, on the other hand, is delocalized throughout space. It has amplitude at all points in space. And so these are fundamentally different kinds of entities. And uh, it's not really possible to be both things at the same time. Uh, rather, I think it's better to say that tiny objects sometimes behave like waves, sometimes behave like particles. Uh, but really, they're not well described by either concept. We're very familiar with these concepts. They go back a long, long way. But uh, neither one is really appropriate for describing things in the quantum world. So uh, there's a lesson here, which is that uh, we can accept the weird, but we, don't, uh, we should not accept the logically inconsistent. Uh, in the early days of, of quantum theory, Niels Bohr wrote that quantum physics was irrational. Later, he kind of changed that perspective and, and used different language. It's not that it's irrational. It's not that it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't adhere to concepts that we're very familiar with. So all right, there is this idea that the tiny objects sometimes behave like waves, other times like particles. When do they behave like waves? When do they behave like particles? And the short answer is they behave like waves when they are not being observed. And they behave like particles when they are being observed. So already this is very strange. How do they know, right? Um, and uh, it, it's almost as if they're, um, uh, they're doing it on purpose or something. It's a very uh, strange state of affairs. Uh, but the other thing, the thing that's relevant for this presentation is that this situation underscores the importance of the observer in quantum physics. These are very, very different behaviors. You can't go smoothly from one to the other, really. And so it's an either-or situation that implies that the role of the observer isn't something that can be made arbitrarily small, which is uh, the assumption, for example, of classical physics. So it's, it's, uh, the observer plays a very, very different role here. OK, so now we're going to get a little bit technical. And we're going to discuss how quantum objects behave when they're acting as a wave. And when they're acting as a wave, they're described by something we call the wave function. So what is the wave function? Uh, it's a theoretical construct used to describe the particle motion when it is not being observed. It's a, and a kind of wave of probability. We'll discuss that a little bit more later on. Now, some people might object to my use of the phrase theoretical construct. There's still actually a lot of debate about whether the wave function is a real thing that, that physically exists or not. I use this language, though, to, because a, a wave is never observed as a wave. When we observe quantum objects, we always observe them as particles, not as waves. We can infer a wave, uh, but we never actually see a wave when we make an observation. So that's, that's why I use this phrase theoretical construct in this context. Now, the wave function actually plays a kind of a double role. It tells us what happens when we're not looking at a quantum object. Uh, but it also gets used in a very different way to tell us what happens when we do look at a quantum object. As I said, when we look at a quantum object, when we measure its, its position, 
it always appears as a particle. It always appears in a very definite position. We never see multiple particles or, or a wave. Uh, so this is a, a process that's known as, as wave function collapse. And it's what happens when ob an observer makes a measurement uh, of, of a particle. And this process, I want to emphasize, is very different from the first process. The first process is a smooth, continuous, flowing wave, like a, like a fluid, like a wave moving along. The second process is something that's discrete, it's very sudden, and it's also random. It's not deterministic. One can't predict in advance what outcome one will obtain. However, one can predict very accurately what the probabilities are that any given outcome will be observed. So what I'm going to do now is take everything I've just mentioned and put it in more math language. So let's start with a classical particle, which occupies a single position at a given point in time. So for example, in this e illustration here, the particle is at position one, at point one. Now, of course, over time, the position can change. Right? So the position here plays the role of the, of the state of the particle in, in classical physics, more or less. And uh, so this changes over time, but it's, it's determined by the position of the particle for our purposes. In quantum mechanics, that same particle gets described by this wave function. And there are certainly contexts where the wave function looks like a classical state, where it uh, corresponds to just a single position. So by the way, don't let this funny notation uh, scare you off. Um, this is just uh, this is standard notation we use in, in quantum physics. But just think of that um, a little funny bracket thing as representing the state of the system in quantum mechanics. We usually call it psi. We use uh, the Greek letter psi to denote the state. And so this state can more or less correspond to the classical state in some circumstances. However, most of the time, a single quantum state actually spans many positions in what's known as a superposition state. So for example, we can imagine a, a wave function, a quantum state, that has probability at both position one and position two. And this would be represented by this superposition state, which is listed at the bottom of the, the slide here, that has contributions from one and two, and also has these little numbers in front of, of those states, C1 and C2. Those are called amplitudes. They have to do with the probability that the particle will be observed in either of those two positions when and if we choose to make a measurement of the particle's position. So um, at this point, we introduce an observer to make such a measurement. We call her Alice. And I'm not being, I put Alice in quotes because Alice could be a person. It could be a, an inanimate classical measuring device. It could be, um, uh, I'm, I'm being very vague about what Alice actually is at the moment. And so first off, what happens when Alice does not measure the position? Uh, then the wave function remains in a superposition state, evolved, evolving smoothly deterministically, as I mentioned. So the amplitudes may change over time, but the, the wave is still a wave. Uh, on the other hand, if Alice decides to make a measurement of the, of the particle's position, uh, then we get a sudden change. And the wave function either becomes a position state wave function corresponding to the first position or the second. One or the other of these two things happens randomly with probabilities determined by the amplitudes. They're actually given by the square of the amplitudes, so C1 squared and C2 squared. So those probabilities have to add up to 1. So the point is that this is a very, very different kind of process than what happens when observation or measurement uh, isn't taking place. And, and it does require an observer to bring about. So this is the part, really, of the quantum theory that's uh, mysterious and, and even today um, not, uh, not so well understood. OK, now the next uh, concept I want to mention is a, is a tricky one, but I think very, very important. It really gets to the heart of, of, uh, of all of the, uh, the quantum observer mysteries. So in quantum mechanics, the wave function doesn't actually describe individual particles. We like to think of a particle's wave function, but in fact, the wave function describes the whole quantum system, which consists of many particles, generally speaking. And um, so we have to be a little bit careful of uh, referring to the wave function of an individual particle. Uh, but then, of course, this automatically begs the question, does the wave function include lots and lots of particles, including particles that uh, are configured uh, as an observer known as Alice? In other words, is the observer itself 
part of the quantum system? If so, then, then the observer can't actually bring about collapse of the wave function. We need some uh, still more external entity to, to bring that about. So this is really get, starting to get at the heart of the measurement problem or observation problem. And it has to do with the fact that the wave function doesn't describe individual particles. So um, yeah, this gives rise to the Schrodinger's cat or Alice dilemma. Basically, the idea is that macroscopic objects, animals, even human beings, might be in some kind of superposition state of multiple possibilities. So let's take a look at how this comes about mathematically. So if Alice is part of the quantum system, she has her own wave function. And um, let's, um, for purpose of illustration, let's imagine that she only has two states, one in which she's observed the particle in being at position one, and one in which she's observed the particle at being at position two. So then we have 1a and 2a as possible states for Alice. And after the measurement, her state and the state of the particle become correlated, or what we call entangled, giving rise to this combined superposition here uh, that involves uh, two terms just as before. Only now we see that, that her state itself is split, just like the state of the particle is, is split. And so we can talk about a, another observer, Bob, who's outside the system and observes the Alice plus particle system uh, by simply asking the question, where did you see the particle? And then Alice responds and tells him. Uh, then and only then, according to this viewpoint, the wave function collapses to either of the two outcomes. But the problem here is that Alice, of course, has a sense all along about where the particle is. She made the measurement sometime previously and has, has a clear picture in, in her mind about what happened. So there's a, there's a kind of a tension and an and a, um, inconsistency here, which Ken Wharton will talk about a bit more in his uh, upcoming presentation. So how do we make sense of all of this? Uh, well, we're going to get into this in the later discussion. What I'm going to do now is actually pre present some slides that, that helps to sort of formulate uh, the discussion that we'll get into later. Ken and I might, will have a, a dialogue together on this. So key to this idea, in addition to the, the concept that a wave function is not just of a single particle, but for the quantum system as a whole, is the idea of configurations and the role that they play in quantum theory. So what is a configuration? Well, think about it. If we have a wave that describes a bunch of particles, then what matters is not the position of one particle, but the positions of all the particles in our quantum system. So that's what a configuration is. Now, configurations play a role in classical physics, too. Only there, you have a single configuration at any given time. And that's all that matters. That, that's all that exists. In quantum physics, somehow, many configurations seem to matter. So this is really the, um, the heart of quantum mechanics. Not only do you have many configurations, they interact in some sense. And that interaction can be thought of as, as quantum mechanics, as a source of, of quantum strangeness. So uh, it's not necessarily clear that all of these configurations correspond to things that are real, that all exist at the same time, but they nevertheless seem to play some role in, in quantum physics. So I'll take, uh, take you through one example of what I'm talking about with regard to this Alice plus particle system that I mentioned earlier. So this is a very simplified configuration space of just two degrees of freedom or two particles. One is the quantum particle x, that's a horizontal axis. And that is, the scale of that axis is very, very small. Let's say angstroms or nanometers, something like this. Then in the vertical direction, we have the position of, of Alice, which in this case I'm going to take to be an inanimate measuring device. Right, so it's the position of a needle on a gauge. And uh, so this is a much larger scale of centimeters, uh, something like that, say. And initially, no measurement has been made. Right? Alice has not yet made its measurement. And so one has, uh, in the vertical direction, uh, the wave function is uh, not distributed at all. All of the distribution is only in the horizontal direction. And these different points, one through seven, you can think of them as being just different parts of the wave function. You can also, it turns out there's a kind of a many worlds way to interpret what's going on here, but we don't have to get into all that necessarily. We can just think of this as being different parts of the quantum wave. And they're close to each other. They're the configuration points, space, uh, points in configuration space are close to each other. They can interact quantum mechanically. 
Uh, but now we do a measurement. When we do a measurement, the Alice state gets correlated with the particle state, so we get this diagonal distribution. But the thing to keep in mind is that because the vertical distance, the scale of the vertical axis is so much larger, all of these pieces of the wave function are now very far from each other in configuration space, and they can no longer interact quantum mechanically. So that's why one gets radically different behavior after a measurement versus before a measurement. Now again, I want to emphasize this is according to one interpretation, right? An interpretation where the measurement device or the observer is a part of the, of the quantum system. And of course, there are other interpretations as well, which we will get into later on during the discussion. So with that, I thank you.